Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's public forum uh, to discuss the 2021 South Master Development Plan. I'm Scott Pryor. I work with SE Group. We are a planning firm who's assisted South Ski Valley in a variety of master development plans, as well as NEPA permitting processes. Also here tonight, we have our partners at Taos Ski Valley, as well as those at the Forest Service. Um, we look forward to you know, sharing the proposed projects of the master plan with you here this evening. As shown on the previous slide, there will be an opportunity for questions. The best way to get your questions submitted in this forum and this format is to use the Q&A function in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Attendees will not have the ability to speak verbally, so please use this text function to submit comments and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible during tonight's meeting. At the end of the meeting, we're going to reserve about 15 minutes to work through comments. And if we don't get through your comment, there will be an opportunity to submit comments afterwards uh, using a link we'll provide. Um, as just general ground rules, please be respectful in the language you use in your comments. Um, understand that you know there's a lot we're trying to get through here this evening, and we certainly wish we could all be together in person. With that, I'll tra transfer this over to John Kelly with Taos Ski Valley to share some of the exciting projects that Taos is working on. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm sure if I could see the audience, I'd recognize a lot of familiar faces. So thank you again for, for taking the time. And before we get into the, the master development plan and what it is, it's really important for us to start with our vision, purpose, and values. And, and this poster lives on the wall in almost everybody's office as a a goal for us to keep striving towards. We think we've made some, some good strides in this area, but we recognize we have a long way to go. So the first thing in the vision, iconic and independent mountain, better not bigger is a theme that you're gonna hear a lot tonight. It means a lot to us in terms of our planning, confluence of cultures, our B Corp ethos. Then we move to our purpose, enjoy, protect, give, and then our values below. You know, in the mid 90s, the resort was doing um, 350, 365,000 skier visits. We feel like, you know, 280 to 300,000 is kind of the sweet spot for us. And, you know, so this plan is, is much more about refinement than it is growth. And so you're going to see that theme, better not bigger, play out through a lot of these slides in the plan. Next slide, please. The purpose, it's, it's really important to first explain the purpose, the requirement, the scope, and the process of the master development plan before we launch into the improvements proposed in the plan. I promise this will be the only slide that I read word for word, so bear with me, but it's a really important context to have. The master development plan is the guiding document for future development. As part of a mountain resort special use permit with the National Forest Service, the resort is required to prepare a master development plan. The MDP identifies the existing and desired conditions for the resort and the proposed improvements on Forest Service lands within the permit boundary. The MDP ensures a balance of facilities and a wide variety of amenities affording an exceptional recreational experience in a manner which is sustainable to the business, operations, and the surrounding environment. The 2021 MDP replaces the 2010 MDP and is intended to be the guiding document for Taos Ski Valley over the next 10 years. Forest Service acceptance of this document as a planning tool for the ski area does not imply authorization to proceed with implementation of any of the projects proposed as each project will require site-specific environmental analysis and approval per the NEPA process before implementation. The MDP is intended to be a dynamic document, which may be amended periodically to reflect innovations in facilities and recreation. So a key piece of this is, is to really make sure everyone understands that last point and that the acceptance of the MDP by the Forest Service does not mean we can immediately start building. Each project and the projects as a whole have to go through National Environmental Policy Act analysis that is followed up by an impact statement or EIS. So after defining the purpose, this slide and map helped define the scope of the MDP. 
We like to use this map because it does a great job of showing the relationship of our special use permit boundary to all local stakeholders and land uses. The ski resort special use permit or SUP is highlighted in the middle with the red border with the private land and Carson National Forest land to the east. The dark green highlights that you see are the wilderness areas that surround and define the areas around us. And then the tan shows the Taos Pueblo land. The ski area and Carson National Forest um, right now are actively working with the Taos Pueblo leadership to educate our visitors on the history and the uses of the land in our area, including respecting ancestral lands and ensuring that no one trespasses on Pueblo lands via the wilderness. And we'll talk about how we've brought the Taos Pueblo into this process already and gotten their feedback as well. And then the other reason we like to use this map, and, and as we look at this map, I want to emphasize a really key point in that the 2021 MDP has no proposals to expand the size of our boundary. We feel like being surrounded by wilderness is a competitive advantage for our resort and supports our better, not bigger philosophy. And we're really committed to making improvements from within that existing boundary. And we can go to the next slide. So we've defined the purpose. We've defined the scope. Now we're going to define the process. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kent Sharp with SE Group, who is a uh, little bit of a guru in this area. Well, thanks for that introduction, John. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending. Uh, just touch on this uh, graphic here quickly. The process really starts in the lower left hand corner. Um, by identifying the opportunities and deficiency of the existing <coughs> facility. We then move vertically up through that gray box um, with a whole lot of involvement from the Forest Service and, and involvement from stakeholders as well. And there are probably many people on the call this evening that participated in the public forum. Um, started back in 2019, um, a great meeting that was, was hosted by Taos and uh, refreshments were served. It was, it was phenomenal. I wish we could all be together again tonight. Um, we then move horizontally across the top of the graphic with the master development plan having been completed, as John just touched on, um, that does go through a Forest Service acceptance process. And you'll notice we're very emphasis on the word acceptance, not approval. Um, it is the National Environmental Policy Act process um, that does review each of the projects and then ultimately culminate in um, you know, whatever the Forest Service ends up approving at the end of that process. And now I'm down in the, the lower right hand of that with a, an MDP approval. We then move back across the bottom of the box with project implementation, um, implementation, monitoring, and then go back through um, another process for MDP revision and amendment. As we just saw, this process was followed back in 2010. Here we are again um, following this particular circular process. Um, so just a quick overview on how the process works. Many opportunities for the public to participate and have input um, uh, tonight as an example. So thanks for attending. I'm going to turn it back over to John. So before we leave this slide, um, a couple of things that kind of helps me put some stuff into context is um, looking at that purpose and need. So a good example of a purpose and need analysis is replacing a ski lift. The purpose of the ski lift to a ski resort is pretty obvious. The need to replace the ski lift is because it's 30 years old and the ski resort can improve the reliability and uphill capacity by replacing it. So I think as we go through the rest of the slides and we present the upgrade plan, that provides some good context with regards to, you know, how something like a ski lift would move through this process. So this slide for us, it's important to put in context the previous 2010 MDP, the 2017 amendment, and then categorical exclusion work that has occurred over the last seven to eight years. These are the types of projects that were achieved through MDP, NEPA analysis, and other means of Forest Service permitting. The map on the right is our existing conditions map that is used in the MDP to con contrast the upgrade map that we will show in a couple slides. 
One of the reasons that an MDP amendment or categorical exclusion permit is used is that there can be a long time frame in between MDPs. In our case right now, that's that's almost 11 years. So maybe the technology or priorities have changed. Maybe there's a smarter or more sustainable way of doing things that the original MDP did not address. And maybe there's industry trends that have evolved since the previous MDP was accepted. So the amendment to the 2010 plan or the CE work that's occurred since then all still had to go through NEPA, but allowed us to achieve some much needed improvements that were not originally in the 2010 MDP. So since that time, we've installed the Kachina Peak Lift. We've replaced Lift 1. We installed the Gazex Avalanche Mitigation System. We've built mountain bike trail sections. We've installed our first Via Ferrata routes. We've done glading in the Wild West, Ernie's North American, and opened that up to skiing. We've done some improvements to the guest drop-off, rerouted Williams Lake Trail, and then obviously the private land projects, things like the Blake, and some of those items that are not in the Forest Service permit. Things that are ongoing are the mountain bike trail build out, Via Ferrata build out, and continue glading in those areas. And then there's some projects that were approved in 2010 that we have not had a chance to do, but we're going to roll over into this um, new MDP, which is replacing lift four, replacing lift seven, uh, a Nordic skiing snowshoeing area, and then the resort arrival improvements that we'll show a map of in a little bit. One project that we haven't done and we do not plan to do is the ridge lift, and this was addressed in the 2019 uh, public forum as well. All right, so going back to the process triangle, um, stakeholder and public input is a really key piece of the planning process. As Kent mentioned in October 2009 at the Rio Honda Learning Center, we kicked off this process with an open invitation where about 80 attendees joined us. We started with a blank slate, blank maps, and gave the public a chance to first tell us what they wanted before we even started creating the MDP proposal and document. We took all those flip charts and maps and used those ideas to create the majority of the upgrade proposals we're going to show today. This was an approach that was very unique to the MDP process and that other ski resorts have not done or really tried. You know, resorts typically only bring in the public input during the Forest Service comment period once the plan had already been submitted, but we didn't really want to go that route. In addition, we've held multiple meetings with the Taos Pueblo leadership. <clears throat> We've held brainstorming sessions with our staff. Dave Norton, our CEO, has had regular meetings with the village administration where projects are discussed. And then all those, you know, awesome informal discussions that that we've had in the plaza or on a chairlift ride in the winter where we get ideas and feedback, they're all captured in this plan. And then in addition, we held a similar meeting to today's presentation with the village council and residents about two weeks ago. And then obviously today's forum, um, there'll be a two week period to receive input after this forum before submitting to for acceptance to the Forest Service. So as we look at going into the next step, so proposed improvements. I know the key piece of the triangle in the planning stage is identifying the current opportunities and deficiency of the ski area to guide the upgrade plan. This is then put in context of the purpose and need analysis that the Forest Service provides. The reason we have to start here is so that we can first define what our strengths and weaknesses are to guide the specific projects that will then enhance the strengths and improve or eliminate the weaknesses. Through public engagement input and internal analysis, we've identified the following key opportunities and deficiencies that the upgrade plan can address. Base-to-base -base access. Um, this was probably the number one suggestion and request we have received through the public process to develop a better and more efficient way to move people from the main base area to the backside in Kachina Basin. Lifts. We've made some really great strides in the last couple years with replacing the old Strawberry Hill lifts, lift one and adding Kachina Peak but the remainder of our lifts are pushing 30 to 40 years old. We have an incredible lift maintenance team that will keep these lifts going safely as long as we need, but at some point we do need to upgrade to new infrastructure, technology, and faster uphill capacity. 
Guest amenities, another really popular area of feedback we receive via the public process. Our guests want better on mountain amenities in order to stay up on the mountain while being able to meet their needs for lunch, bathrooms, and just a simple place to warm up. As part of this, we recognize that a lot of pressure can be put on the base of one area and Kachina Basin area needs, and would love to provide more on mountain amenities, allowing skiers to stay up on the mountain. The upgraded terrain network, another, um, or sorry, the year round and summer activities, I skipped one there. In 2011, Congress passed the Ski Area Recreational Opportunity Enhancement Act with the Forest Service finalizing policy guidelines in 2014. The goal of that legislation was to promote year-round recreation on ski areas that are natural resource-based and will create additional jobs and economic activity within ski area communities. And ski resorts are really uniquely set up to meet the demands of summer recreation. We already have the infrastructure and landscape to provide guests with a variety of ways to enjoy the outdoors. So with that said, summer activities such as hiking, biking, via frata, and educational interpretive opportunities were areas that were identified for enhancement and improvement. The terrain network, we received some really good public feedback in the area of terrain improvements from skiers who know this mountain really, really well. And we captured that. A lot of the ideas that you see related to terrain and terrain management were also driven from our internal exports in ski patrol, grooming, snowmaking, and lifts. One thing I want to kind of point out regarding terrain is that adjust adjustments and improvements to our trail network and snowmaking system will definitely create big benefits to the skiing itself, but also to the speed at which we open terrain early season and the long-term sustainability of operating a winter resort with climate change. The guest arrival, the parking lot, and the arrival experience has been a big deficiency um, identified by a wide range of users. It's not just the ski area's front door, but the village as a whole. We want this process to be smooth, easy, enjoyable, and visually pleasing. We're going to show the specifics of this plan in just a little bit. Sustainability as part of the ski resorts, B Corp certification and commitment. There's both a requirement and a desire to incorporate alternative energy and net zero initiatives whenever and wherever we can. We received a lot of really good ideas from both the public and internal staff to incorporate alternative energy measures into our upgraded infrastructure. All right, the upgrade plan and map. And I know the map's a little hard to see, but we'll we'll highlight it and we'll zoom in on some areas as we go along. So for kind of some layout purposes, the map on the right is the proposed upgrade plan that includes all the improvement projects in the new MDP. The list on the left is a summary of the bigger improvement projects contained in the map. That definitely does not cover everything. It's just kind of some highlights. As we go through this list, it's important to connect the upgrade projects to the opportunities and deficiencies just listed. Um, all the concepts proposed in the MDP are either addressing, fixing a weakness, or advancing an opportunity. So as we talk about the lifts, if you look at the map on the right, that long red dotted line is showing a proposed base-to-base -base gondola connecting the resort center plaza and the Kachina Basin area. This would run summer and winter, serving multiple purposes. If you follow that red highlight dot right there, you can kind of see it going right along above the Rubazal Trail. And a couple points to make about this. In the winter, it spreads guests out, takes pressure off lift one and lift two lift lines for skiers. It gives a direct route to the backside. And a key piece is it provides backup redundancy to the top of the mountain in the event that lift one were to, were to go down. In the summer, it provides pedestrian access to Kachina Basin, taking a lot of cars off Twining Road. Uh, the gondola cabins would be equipped to carry bikes, creating a really seamless, enjoyable experience to get to the backside. As we kind of move around the mountain um, and we talk about lifts, so Lifts 2, 4, 7, 7A, 8, and Pioneer are all in that 30, 25 to 40 year range. So we're proposing to replace those lifts over an extended period of time with a combination of fixed grip and detachable technologies. 
This also includes a realignment of the Pioneer lift down at the bottom to accommodate a gondola and improve the layout for the beginners in that area. As we move to terrain, a wide variety of trail improvements to existing terrain are included. So the areas you see shaded in orange have been identified for improvement with a combination of grading, widening, retention wall work to improve the flow and safety of skiers. Continuing glading efforts in places like Wild West and the Minnesotas. One thing I like to kind of point out with this note is that if you think about what skiing through Ernie's North American Wild West has done for the mountain experience in the last couple years, those all came about from approvals in the 2010 MVP, and we want to continue that evolution. Snowmaking and snow management upgrades include improvements and additions to our snowmaking pipe network, as well as identifying areas where remote avalanche control systems and wind fence could assist ski patrol with their snow safety efforts. The next item um, that's one of the bigger items we're proposing is a mid mountain water tank and a snowmaking pump house next to it. This is, as you zoom in, it's shown by that blue dot right there. So that's above the base of two and in that tree island between lift two and Poco Gusto. The tank and pump house would be used for fire suppression in the summer and snowmaking efficiency in the winter. A very key point to highlight about this proposal is that a mid-mountain water storage tank in no way changes our water rights or how much water we would use. We would continue to use the same amount of water we always use. We would just be able to use it in a much more efficient manner with less pressure on our diversion points. We would be able to gradually fill the water tank over time to supplement the water that we pull out from our diversion points. The location of this tank and pump house have been strategically located for a couple reasons. Fire suppression, the western edge of our boundary where a fire would likely come up from the canyon and enter the village of Tau Ski Valley has a fire break along the lower Stauffenberg ski run. This combined with the forest health work along the Highway 150 corridor that we'll show in a minute gives us the best chance against a fire coming up the canyon. The water tank would supply water to our existing snowmaking pipe and equipment on the western side of the boundary to fight against the fire in that area. For snowmaking purposes, the elevation and position of this tank will also allow us to be much more efficient with our energy and water use for snowmaking. We can both gravity feed the water down, basically letting um, gravity do its work from the tank to make snow on the front side, as well as push the water up from the pump house over the backside to gravity feed snowmaking on the backside. One of the really cool things about this location is that it will allow us to consolidate a lot of our snowmaking pumping equipment and make snow from this location to almost anywhere on the mountain. All right, the next area is guest amenities. We're proposing a new on-mountain restaurant near the top of lift seven. And one thing I really wanna point out is this in no way would be a big cafeteria style restaurant, you know, that you would see at a big resort. You know, instead picture kind of a whistle stop size building with a nice outside deck. And if you can picture that tree island between Totemoff and Lone Star, there's a relatively flat space out of the way of skiing terrain with great views of Wheeler Peak and Kachina Peak. One nice thing about this location is it would keep guests on the backside, allowing skiers to stay above the base of lift seven and reducing the pressure on the base of one and four areas. Uh, the next location would be a replacement and relocation of the whistle stop to provide a front side location also to stay up on the mountain for lunch or bathrooms or warming up. Uh, the next point in this area are a proposal to do multi-use buildings at the top of lift two and four. So if you know our mountain, we currently have ski patrol headquarter buildings at the top of lift two and four. We'd like to transition these buildings and do, you know, two level multi-use buildings to better serve the needs of patrol, provide some public bathrooms, create a space for summer activities at the top of four and a place to get warm. Uh, the next item is the new resort arrival plan, but we'll show that map in greater detail in just a second. Uh, and then a storage warehouse facility within the existing footprint of the parking lots. Um, you know, 
all of us up here need more proper space for storage and warehouse delivery needs, so that would serve that purpose. Give me just a second, take a little sip of water here. All right, summer. We really like how the activities of mountain biking, via ferrata, and hiking complement the Taos experience. So going back to the language in the Ski Area Recreational Opportunity Act, we really believe that nature-based recreation is what's best for Taos. We are not proposing what I refer to as passive recreation activities that require big infrastructure like an alpine coaster or a big zip line. We want to continue enhancing and offering active and educational recreation like Via Ferrata, mountain biking, and hiking. One of the things our Via Ferrata guides do as part of the experience is talk about the history, geology, and wildlife of the area. Another addition to summer is we'd like to provide a guest-friendly resort hiking trail that would connect the base of one to the top of four and vice versa, taking some pressure off Williams Lake and Wheeler Peak trails. This would go a really long way in keeping guests off the permanent area and reduce some of the traffic into the wilderness. So this is the summary um, of the upgrade map and the projects and concepts we have proposed. There's a little bit more detail um, in this map um, that I'm happy to answer on a on kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis or you'll have an opportunity to provide some email feedback with kind of getting into the details a lot of those text boxes and kind of the specific maybe details of the grading plan and stuff like that. So with that we'll move to the next slide. Okay, um, this is what we are proposing um, as our new resort arrival upgrade plan. The reason you see the 2010 master development plan as the title of that slide is that because this is a previously approved project from the 2010 MDP. It's already gone through NEPA. Um, we just have not proceeded with it yet. We did achieve some improvements in the past in the drop off area, but this is a much more um, this plan is more consistent with the overall plan that was approved in 2010. <clears throat> so one thing I want to highlight is if you look at the box in the top right corner, the original approval allowed for 14.3 acres of disturbance, and the current plan is estimating 7.6 acres of disturbance. So this new plan actually reduces um, the area of disturbing um, and kind of dirt work and things like that. And so just to kind of reinforce, you know, as stated earlier, the parking lots are the front door to our amazing village and wilderness. And we really want the entryway and the lots to better reflect the beauty around us than it is right now. There's a lot of details on this map that we can spend um, some more time, but, but it really boils down to a couple key aspects. First is developing a proper entryway drive and green belt. We want people to enter exit on a proper two lane green belt and drive and not have to drive through the big wide parking lots like Cody and Armadillo. So if you follow that red laser and if you know what bison lot is, basically turning bison lot into a two-way entryway point that comes up, easily connects Twining Road for village residents or folks that are going back to the Kachina Basin, but also provides a very um, well thought out kind of more robust drop-off zone. The second aspect um, that this plan really enhances is the drop-off zone and flow of guest experiences between entering, parking, and exiting. As we all know, it's a little convoluted and confusing right now, specific, you know, specifically you've not been here before, so this plan would really clean that up. We were able to try a real scaled-down version of a drop-off zone this winter, and it worked really well, and, and we learned a lot and, and kind of got a lot of good beta to build on with regards to a more official plan that's shown in this design. Uh, the third aspect is control and security. We'd like to gate the bigger lots. You're gonna see each lot kind of has a more narrow entryway so that we can provide access when we need to park those areas, but that we can lock them, um, secure them, and not have cars spread out um, in various locations. This really helps us for our snow removal efforts and just kind of general security and safety. The other key elements will include signage, lighting, pedestrian walkways, and RV parking. 
Um, we really love the van life and supporting that. We want to do it in a little bit more organized um, fashion, so you'll start to see us kind of work in that direction as well. And this will likely be a multi-year process um, with us starting the entry road and the drop-off zone first, hopefully this summer, and then kind of moving on to, to the bigger lots and the landscaping and things like that after that. After that. We can go to the next slide. So the next couple slides are just highlighting some forest work um, that we're hoping to do this summer. And as, as many of you know, there's a, a bigger effort going on between the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Rio Grande Water Fund, um, the Taos Valley Watershed Coalition, um, the Taos Pueblo, the Forest Service, the ski area, and, and really kind of all of the entities coming together to do what we can to prevent wildfire in the area and, and do it responsibly. And so you see, you know, the different user groups up top, the forest products, the recreation, legacy, tribal communities, acequias and communities, forest and clean water and healthy fisheries. So as we go through some of these highlights of the work that we're going to um, hope to bite off this, this summer and kind of continue forward, you know, it's really with the goal of keeping all these entities in mind. We can go to the next slide. This is a nice graphic that we'd like to use. I'd like to highlight it. Um, you know, I don't think we can zoom in on this yet, but the Rio Grande Water Fund project basically um, connects all those communities that are dependent on the Rio Grande as it comes down from the mountain. You know, and, and as, um, you know, one of the beginnings, um, and kind of um, being at the uh, the top of the canyon, we take this responsibility extremely seriously and, and we're putting a lot of efforts and resources into that. So you want to go to the next slide? All right. So this is the Highway 150 Forest Health Project that got started by the Carson National Forest in 2017. And we were only highlighting a little bit. It continues to go down. Um, Highway 150 as you go through the canyon, but it established key areas of thinning and forest health along Highway 150, which as most of you know is the road leading up to the ski valley. And in, in order to basically protect against the fire coming up the canyon. So to this point, um, a lot of prep work and analysis and prescriptions and inventory have done have, have been completed, but work on the ground has not started yet in those prescribed areas. And if you look at the Wild West section there highlighted in red and the Minnesotas in red, these are areas within the ski area special use permit that we are ready to get some traction on this summer. And we're starting to really put some resources behind it. So the area known as the Wild West that extends from below the base of eight down to Ocean Boulevard is about 100 acres and it is included in the Highway 150 corridor plan that was already approved by the Forest Service. And this spring, we've met several times with the Forest Service on site and working on a collaborative plan with experienced forest management specialists and cutting teams to execute the prescription that the Forest Service has laid out. Some of the work will be done with a masticator. Uh, if, if anybody's walked up um, kind of above the Phoenix uh, in, in that area that we did some mastication work a couple years ago that came out really, really well um, and in the kind of the ground is is really um, established as well. That's the goal um, with the mastication work. That work would occur on slopes below 40 percent. And then in the steeper train we'd be doing with hand crews. We hope to start the mastication work in June and the hand crew work in July kind of per usual all depends on the snow melt. But with this as you kind of start to see the full picture of this work combined with the natural fire break of the ski runs on the western boundary over there and the location of the proposed water tank, we feel like we're really making um, great strides and progress in the wildfire protection of the ski valley as a whole and not just the resort. And then depending on how the summer goes um, with restrictions and how the work goes, we hope to get into the Minnesotas and, and do some other areas as well. All right, well, that is it. And I appreciate everybody's time and for listening to me uh, throughout. 
And so a couple next steps for us. Um, we have an email address set up, mdpfeedback at skitaus.com. We will start checking that after this meeting. Over the next two weeks, we're going to solicit public feedback uh, based on these proposals and concepts, consolidate all that input from, from the public, review it, and then we'll prepare our plan for submittal to the Forest Service. We would then submit the MDP to the Forest Service for acceptance. Forest Service will take some time to review again to make sure it fits with the forest plan and ski area uses. Then at that point, you enter into the NEPA process, secure MDP approvals after the NEPA analysis, and then we would start to prioritize and begin projects on the mountain that were approved. So again, thanks everybody. Um, I wish I could see your face. I wish I could have you know have a good catch up with you after the meeting in person if we could do that but i know we'll get to do it soon and at this point um we're going to start taking some q a so if we can leave john live i'll go ahead um, start reading a few of the questions and uh, john will have you answer most of those um we also have District Ranger Adam Lydell with us um, who may help answer some of the questions as well. So um, first question, can you please describe the Nordic skiing plan? Definitely, so on the Nordic skiing plan, uh, this is actually was approved as part of our 2017 amendment to the MDP. There's an area identified down along Ocean Boulevard kind of towards the bottom of um, that Wild West area that I just described. We were in the very beginning stages. Um, we've done some kind of initial planning with some kind of Nordic skiing planning experts. So that's the area that we've looked at. OK, John, the next question, where would overnight lodging parking be? We do have um, an area identified for overnight lodging. So if you were up here this winter, we had that area kind of in the bear lot. Um, it wouldn't be necessarily in that area, but it would be a little bit kind of an, uh, based on that design, if you came down from the drop off zone, came down the hill, like you're going towards Armadillo lot, there's gonna be an established area there, but that's definitely um, an aspect that we realized that we've gotten some good traction on in terms of providing um, overnight lodgers with a kind of condensed consolidated area to park. And then also from our end, um, it helps our snowplow guys in the middle of the night uh, feel a lot more comfortable with removing snow with having all the cars in one area. Okay, thanks, John. Um, we've had a number of questions regarding uh, the maps and the maps being made available in a PDF format or on the website. And John or Scott, you might, one of you guys might speak to the plan for that, please. Uh, the map would be included um, in the submittal as part of the MDP document to the Forest Service, which will be a um, public document. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have anything to add on that front. No, I think that's appropriate, John, that, you know, the maps and the entire package that we'll that we've shared here after a little bit of refining uh, following the feedback from this meeting will be submitted to the Forest Service. Um, I think, you know, at this point, probably more specific requests, the better in terms of providing any mapping um, to individuals. If there's a particular area, you know, that would help inform your question. Um, I think that's something that could probably be shared prior to the submittal, but I think um, in terms of making the entire plan available, want to follow, you know, the appropriate procedural steps and make sure that the Forest Service has the first opportunity to review this material. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer that that top question. So how will summer activities be made affordable for the local community via Ferrata's beyond most locals budgets? Um, last week or last week, last year was um, was a weird year um, with regards to um, kind of both launching our new mountain bike um, offering and Via Ferrata offering uh, and getting it going um, and also in the time of COVID and, and trying to figure that out. Uh, with our Via Ferrata pricing, um, we are likely proceeding with a weekday price and a weekend price and then offering 
um, a bigger five person group that per person um, brings that price down uh, less than it was last year. So uh, it's definitely something that um, we're aware of and we're going to continue to find ways to um, get people um, more exposed and involved in those those two activities because we're really proud of them and, and um, we want as many people to experience that specifically the Via Ferrata for folks that haven't done it. It's it's a really cool activity. Um, John, if you could describe the tan areas on one of the last maps that you presented. Scott, are you going to go back to that? Oh, that, those tan areas. Um, so those areas are areas that are approved and defined um, as uh, important in this Highway 150 corridor work. Um, the red actually is basically red because the Forest Service deemed it as more critical in the tan areas, um, less critical, but but important. So there is a system um, in terms of priority that the Forest Service defined based on those colors. Good question. The, there was two questions around the Minnesotas. Uh, where specifically are the Minnesotas? And then a um, buyer question. Let me scroll down to that one while you answer that one, John. Uh, the Minnesotas are an area that is is closed terrain. Um, it's it's what we refer to it um, as kind of internally, but yeah, it's that area right there. It's below the base of seven, basically between the uh, Rubazal Trail and the base of seven. And then the follow on question to that from Ken, please explain why the forest work in the Minnesotas is being done and why it's important. Um, for example, lots of dying and dead trees as opposed to skiing terrain. Is that the case? The first priority is the dead and dying, um, and that's that's definitely the ski resort's priority as well. Um, it's it's going to be a while before, if and when, we open that up to skiing. The bigger priority is the forest health and the fire risk that the Minnesotas presents. So that's why we're trying to jump on that as soon as possible. I think when everybody kind of drives up Twining Road and looks up in the Minnesotas, it's it's pretty apparent. Um, the work that needs to be done and how much debt is in there. So that's that's the priority over opening it to skiing um, anytime soon. Okay, John, another commenter asked, what's the part of the plan that you're most excited about? This is a great question and I wish I could throw this back out to the audience, um, but for me it's the base-to-base -base gondola. I think as we look at kind of uh, you know game changers for how this mountain operates, there's so many exciting ways that we can move guests around the mountain summer winter um, you know it provides so much redundancy it creates some really um, unique flow of getting to the backside and front side and you know maybe getting people to um, the Bavarian for lunch or whatever it might be or vice versa uh, but the base-to-base -base gondola is something that um, I'm really excited about. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, is there a plan for adding some glading in the terrain that is not so challenging? Uh, for example, intermediate terrain. That's a really good question. Uh, we we definitely looked at various areas of glading. I think a lot of the kind of the more blue level areas um, we've done a lot of glading in already, and we definitely need to clean up and maintain and continue to improve. Uh, but like everything in Taos, um, it's steep and narrow, so we'll continue to look for some blue areas that we can open up so it's not all steep. Great suggestion. Uh, the next question, back to kind of a fire question. If there was a fire up the valley, how much of a difference would these changes thinning in the water tank make in fighting that kind of event? Uh, we, th we think it would make a really big difference, and um, you know, I, I we're putting a lot of both financial and um, you know staffing and planning resources into that. You know we we want to be prepared. I, I think that's a hard question to know exactly, and I'm and I'm not a you know fire management or fuels team expert, but you know I think it's one of those things that every improvement helps, and every improvement is an improvement versus um, kind of keeping the status quo right now, but it's going to be not just up to the ski valley. It's going to be 
um, up to all those kind of land users that I showed around that map uh, to all of us work together to um, to mitigate it. We might almost also take a second here to ask District Ranger Adam Liddell to um, speak to that as well, John, if, if we could make um, Adam live, please. Can you please repeat the question? As John was speaking to the areas of thinning, the water tank and the fire mitigation projects, Adam, um, how much of a difference would that make if a fire were to come up the valley? Uh, a big difference. I think that was just used down. To, I think Ski Apache just did it. Some other resorts throughout the nation do that as well, too. Um, so we can use the water tank and the snow making devices to spray water to put up a line for a fire break without having to put firefighters up there, uh, which saves our capacity. So we can use natural graduate gravity fed um, to spread water throughout the area to create a fire break and put our resources in other areas to create a, a, a to enclose a fire and prevent from getting up to the village. Um, so that, that helps us tremendously in that capacity. With water up there already as well too, that's another big advantage. Uh, we can use it as a gravity fed system, so we're not pumping water out of other sources that might be needed as dip sites for the helicopter. Um, those are just some of the advantages off the top of my head right now, um, which is a huge advantage to the Forest Service uh, for capacity, mm -hmm. for, for keeping our firefighters uh, on their mission and in safe areas. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, I'll read the next question as you switch back over to John live. Um, John, I've had a couple of questions regarding the priority for lift replacements. Can you speak to the order the lifts might be replaced? And there's also a question from a um, attendee wanting to know what the size of the gondola will be in terms of the people per carrier. So on the lift capacity, uh, you know, it's kind of a combination of um, importance obviously to the mountain and then also the age um, and the condition of the lift. <clears throat> so I would say that um, you could call it 1A, 1B, um, you know, beyond the, the new addition of a base-to-base -base gondola, uh, replacing lift four and lift two would be, um, call it 1A, 1B, as we look at how guests get around the mountain and, you know, the flow and the capacity and looking at kind of obviously um, some of the lift lines at the base of two, um, but also the summer use of lift four would really benefit from a detachable versus a fixed grip. So, I, you know, those are the bigger priorities for, for lift replacement. In terms of the gondola capacity, we're still looking at that. And it's it really is a kind of a strategic decision um, with regards to how many people we need to move, but but not necessarily creating too much capacity where we're um, you know transporting too many people up to Kachina Basin in, in a quick manner so that's a balance that we're still looking at. And John while you're speaking about the gondola there's been a couple more questions posted um, would the gondola only be a day ski operation or would it also operate in the evenings and would you need a lift ticket in order to <laughs> ride the gondola? Uh, still aspects that were um, you know that are part of the planning process and analysis and you know this will be a big project for the forest service to review as part of this and so um, there'll be kind of parameters put around that with regards to the approval uh, so a little little too early to tell um, you know in terms of the demand and the need uh, but it would be it would be more than just a ski area winter it would definitely be a summer use um, but kind of beyond that of of how and when we would use it is to be determined, you know, um, a resort like Telluride shuts it down for um, a couple months during their off seasons and things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of good kind of examples of um, comparatively kind of how to use it as part of the both ski resort, but also public transportation. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, Question regarding plans for the Hotel St. Bernard now that it's officially owned by Taos Ski Valley. And John, that's a really good um, question. I know um, a lot of folks are, are interested in those um, kind of potential plans. It's it's definitely 
Um, one, it's not my area of expertise. Um, there are conversations going on um, and it's a little too early to uh, provide any details on that other than um, it's going to be extremely important for the ski resort to um, do whatever we can to you know keep the the tradition um, and the lore and just the the mystique and the magic of the St. Bernard um, going regardless of, of what happens. And just a quick interjection here between some of the questions. There's been a number of questions uh, uh, posted um, with regard to certain resource impacts associated with proposed, proposed projects. Um, some of these include hydrology, wildlife, even climate change for that matter. And, you know, some of these impacts may be known or speculated upon, but I just wanted to chime in that, you know, if we go back to our uh, flow chart here, those are questions that are typically answered in the NEPA process. So, you know, before we get into some of those questions, uh, please note that we've seen them. Adam with the forest is here. You know, we're all thinking about the same things um, in terms of resource impacts, but we don't necessarily have those answers yet. So just wanted to mention that don't feel like your comment has been glossed over. Um, they're just not questions that we can actually accurately answer, but know that those are the types of resource impacts that will be studied as projects get pulled into site specific review and a NEPA analysis. For this next one, we'll go back to John. Um, can you speak just a bit more about the plan for developing an RV parking area so that itinerant skiers in RVs can park safely, securely, and with power? Yes, so part of the parking lot reconfiguration is better establishing and developing a, um, I don't know if you'd call it professional, but uh, definitely something that's um, more in line with what people expect at other um, areas to park campers. So we do plan to, um, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to go as far as, you know, power and dump station and things like that, because I think a lot of the campers and overnight vehicles that we see these days are, are pretty self-sufficient, whether it be solar panels or, or things like that, but um, providing bathrooms and, you know, a nice pedestrian walkway, that yellow line that you see through the plan there is um, what we want to be kind of a nice, enjoyable trail that connects the RV area to the main resort. So we don't have all the details yet other than, you um, this is a trend that I don't think is going away and we love and we want to support it. And, you know, I think it's really cool that um, the folks that are, you know, touring around different ski areas uh, in their campers and, and a big part of, um, you know, the culture at various areas. So um, it's in the works, but not all the details are finalized yet. For the next one, we'll go back to Ranger Lydell. Um, Adam, if you could speak to, will the Forest Service be participating or assisting in the thinning of trees and the fire mitigation areas that were shown on the tan and, and red areas of the map? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so part of that 150 uh, Forest Health project was ready to prescription for the areas. Um, so the areas within a special use permit will be done by the South Ski Valley themselves. We do not have the resources um, to help with that other than them writing the prescription. So they're responsible for those areas while our capacity is working outside within the Forest Service area itself, not within the special use permit area. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, Dr. John, if we could please, um, can you describe the Pioneers rope course, ropes course? Yep, um, and I'll hit that question from James right above it. How many new bike park trails per year is TESV forecasting? Um, we brought about a quarter of the mile, a uh, quarter of a mile of the blue trail online last year, and that's gonna be our main focus this year is hitting the ground running and <clears throat> getting as much blue trail built as possible and we'll open that up. We'll open sections of that up as we as we finish it. Um, so you're not having to wait for the whole thing to be completed. Uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna keep going every summer and, until we really have this uh, bike park built out per the approval. So 
Uh, and then the next one's the Pioneer um, Ropes course. We have um, proceeded um, previously. So just to clarify, the Pioneer is private land. So it's not forest service land, but because it's a summer amenity and activity and, and, and part of our resort, we it is included in the MDP, but it is private land. So we've we've done some studies and, and some designs and stuff in that Pioneers area, um, but based on uh, potentially going with a base-to-base -base gondola that would fly over that area, we wanted to kind of take a step back, hold off, um, and make sure that we weren't building something that would then conflict with a base-to-base -base gondola. So it's definitely still in the plans because we want to spread the summer users out, not put everybody in the Kichina Basin. We, we're going to continue to offer stuff here in the base area, and that will be one of them eventually. Okay, there's still a few more questions remaining here, John. Um, and I will comment that anything in the base area um, is not necessarily part of the master development plan because it's not a national forest. Um, there's definitely a few questions around operations and those types of things. We'll ask John to, to answer them, but they're not specific to the forest service master planning process. Um, the uh, one along those lines with any plans for a small brewery or brew pub in the base area. A great question, of course. <laughs> um, you know, I hope so. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the ski area only has a, a handful of properties and down here and, and a lot of other folks um, do as well. So hopefully there's some plans to use um, one of these spaces down here for a brew pub um, and a brewery. I would definitely support it. Absolutely. But uh, as far as I know, there's no current plans. And the next question, perhaps a bit more controversial than beer, um, will there ever be a T-bar from the top of two to the ridge? Uh, Tammy, um, good question. We do not have plans to do that. Uh, there was a, um, that I referenced the ridge lift in the 2010 MDP. It was a lift that kind of shot up from the top of eight um, up on West Basin. We do not plan to um, proceed with that. And in kind of the same vein, uh, we are not proposing any lifts from the top of two up to the ridge. Uh, we definitely, you know, as we look at kind of um, maintaining the uh, the mystique and the culture um, in the skiing of Taos, uh, we we like the hike two experience from the top of two up to the ridge, and and plan to keep it that way. Um, the next question I'll just address quickly was a question from Joe around the tentative date for lift replacements. As we've talked about earlier in the presentation, um, you know, the process is uh, fairly intensive from a standpoint of Forest Service review, acceptance and approval, um, you know, probably in the order of 12 months or more before those projects would be through a Forest Service um, review and approval process. Um, John, we'll go on to one regarding uh, TSB's plans for building any staff housing or dorms in the ski valley. Yeah, we've we've made some good strides in this. Um, as, as a lot of folks know with the Columbine, we're using that for staff housing um, and potentially adding some units there. So we're, we're kind of constantly, um, you know, looking for areas to um, find proper um, spaces for our staff. I mean, I think as we all know, that's a big problem in, in ski resorts and ski resort communities. So it's a big priority for us. Um, we've made some really good strides in the last couple of years, and we're going to continue to find um, as many kind of areas that we can uh, for that as possible. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, I am triaging here a little bit for questions, prioritizing questions that are specific to master plan and master planning processes, as opposed to um, just general operational questions. Um, what was the cultural area in the middle of the parking lot complex map? I could chime in on that one really quick. Um, as John mentioned, the parking lot uh, reconfiguration was included in the 2010 master development plan. Um, and then analyzed in a subsequent 2012 NEPA analysis. In that analysis, um, there were cultural resources identified in that area, and more or less that polygon that you see identified as the cultural area on that map is identified as a avoidance area, as in there are sensitive cultural resources 
and any plans should remain outside of that area. So you'll notice that any development grading earthwork type projects are not infringing on that polygon. And the details of what's in that polygon, um, typically cultural uh, resource information is kept uh, pretty quiet just to make sure that you know those resources aren't disturbed. Um, certainly the you know further details would be available in that past analysis, but that is kind of the gist of what that polygon represents. So back to John for more of a master plan question. Do you have an idea of where the new whistle stop would be located? We, I guess we, I wouldn't say we have an idea. We have, um, I, yeah, we, we have a little bit of an idea, but that's definitely um, a location and a building that um, we look forward to kind of continuing to advance a design um, and a planning process um, based on uh, the forest service analysis and approval and things like that. So uh, it, it would likely land um, in the vicinity um, of where it is now, um, you know, because we do recognize that we need a location on the front side to complement what we want to do on the back side. So it would be on the front side, but the final location is not determined yet. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, forecasts for projected number of skier visits in winter and summer users for the next five to 10 years versus the number that TSV is doing today. And, and Carlos, if you joined us in the very beginning, um, I did mention that um, in terms of winter users, uh, you know, back in the mid 90s, there were, you know, the resort was doing 350,000 skier visits. Um, we have not gotten up to that number um, and we actually uh, don't really plan to. We there's what well, we've kind of viewed as a sweet spot, you know, around 280 to 300,000 on a, on a good year, a good snow year is is where we want to be and kind of get back up to so um, we actually feel like uh, again a lot of these <clears throat> upgrades and improvements and plans are to accommodate um, a, a balanced um, user and kind of skier visit number compared to maybe what the resort was doing 30 years ago and i would just chime in too to piggyback on john's response um, from a nepa nerd perspective that um, you know, each lift in the master development plan is assigned a carrying capacity, and as site-specific projects are pulled forward in NEPA review, those capacities and the number of visitors they could generate will be analyzed in both socioeconomic and recreation uh, resource sections as well. So, somewhere between kind of a, of course, you know, Taos is thinking about these things, and there's a plan. Um, however, there's also a subsequent NEPA process where. Um, each individual project um, and in terms of its impact on visitation will be analyzed. So another one that's kind of bridging that gap uh, of the NEPA triangle we showed earlier. So um, question here in regard to um, in conjunction with the village and the current plans and assuring water quality standards for downstream communities um, are, are continued to be met. Um, John, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, and, and you know, that's primarily um, on the village with the new wastewater treatment facility that they installed last year. Um, so I don't have all the information on that other than, um, you know, in terms of water use and water quality. Um, I mean, water is life and, and we absolutely um, want to make sure that we're being good stewards of the water um, up in the Ski Valley and what's flowing downstream. So. We work really closely with, you know, with regards to project implementation. Every project um, has, you know, SWIP plans involved and best management practices from the Forest Service. Um, so any type of project that would get implemented would have, um, you know, parameters and rules and guidelines around, um, you know, proximity to the stream and things like that. But in terms of water quality, um, I know the village administration and the public works do a really good job of testing um, and meeting every uh, qualification certification reporting that they need to with the state. So absolutely, um, that's um, a high priority and importance for both the ski area and the village. 
Okay, so we're going to do one last quick question that's been published here, John, and then uh, we'll let you make a kind of a couple of closing comments if you'd like. Um, any any forecasted increase in prices for guests and lift tickets and season pass prices? Uh, we came out with our spring sale, our spring season pass sale, uh, I guess about a month ago, and the all the season pass prices were reduced um, from this this season and provide a really good kind of wide range of offerings um, that, that we feel um, we've got a lot of good feedback on. So uh, the prices on the passes have dropped from last year and we're really excited to uh, hopefully operate this ski season um, in a post uh, you know COVID safe practices world. Um, obviously there's going to be a lot of continued factors that will stay in you know with state guidelines on but looking forward to um, opening it up more than we were able to this past year. Well that will conclude the Q&A session. Um, thanks for all the great answers there John. Um, back to the micro brew you're probably about ready for beer at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and I want to say uh, thank you to SE Group. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, this this organization, um, Kent and Scott and Will behind the scenes, they're total pros, uh, and and they do they're they're experts in this field, and it's really um, great for us and the Forest Service to work with them because they they ensure that we're all doing um, things the right way and in the right process and at the right speed. Uh, I want to thank Adam Liddell. Um, who is now the Equestra District Ranger um, as of late. And if you haven't got to meet him, he's an amazing guy who really supports this area and works really hard to, to make sure we have what we need, um, all of us, not just the ski resort um, from, from the Forest Service. So, and it looked like, um, if I could tell, we, we peaked at 110 attendees. So I'll take that. And I really appreciate um, all everybody out there um, all the feedback you've given us, please shoot emails to that, e that email address there and um, we'll continue to keep, keep you updated and, and feel free to reach out to me direct and uh, look forward to seeing everybody. You know, we couldn't do this without you, um, probably people from all over, but uh, the local community and a wide range of user groups, whether you ski up here or not. So thank you and look forward to seeing each of you uh, up on the mountain summer or winter.